So we're really, really, really happy to have Felix here talking to us about a very much of a systems problem that many of us haven't thought about before, in that we're, we in the, the whole world on, on Spaceship Earth, uh, we, we don't have any place to stop off and get a, new resources for our, our, our crews through space. And uh, one of the things that's been somewhat neglected in looking at sustainability has been every time we build a building, especially a building that build out certain kinds of materials that last indefinitely or at least very long time by human time scales, is that uh, th when you build them, you put invest a lot of energy into them. Now it may have been, you know, in Roman times, uh, you had lots and lots of slave labor, but that was still an energy investment um, and a materials investment too. We we eventually start running out of materials as we are, um, as we've seen in many for many situations, uh, many th materials that humans need uh, for our civilization to continue. Um, anyhow, so uh, Felix now is, one, is very, one of the few people leading in that area, uh, looking into in infrastructure, civil civil type infrastructure, architectural infrastructure, um, how you how you analyze this kind of problem and what you can do about it. So it's very much a systems problem of, you know, you have resources, you have energy, you have human needs, etc. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to his talk, and uh, I'll let. Felix, take it from here. Thanks. Great, thank you, Al. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to, to be able to speak here today. I'm also happy that I um, joined uh, Systems Engineering because uh, I fully agree with, with Al that um, these problems are um, systems problems. Um, and uh, I hope that this small um, slideshow is gonna going to show you um, why why this is so important, um, but also the kind of scope of it, because of course, um, uh, in architecture, we, we deal with the little detail, how to actually put these materials together all the way to the, to the kind of big picture of, of urban planning and all the kind of social and economic aspects that, that buildings um, uh, have on on society on all of us i mean we are all constantly in buildings so i think this is it is very much a, a systems question um maybe a couple of words about myself um i'm an assistant professor in the department of architecture um, and i just started this uh, january which is maybe not the best time to start a new <laughs> endeavor but why not um uh, and and so i've started something that is called the um, circular construction lab here um, at aap um, and we're trying to and and that's really what my talk is going to be about um question how we can build um a, a different kind of built environment um, that works not as a as a linear sink of materials and knowledge and, and embodied carbon, um, but as a, a kind of circular system, a storage of materials and values um, that can be repeatedly used. And that has um, effects on, as I said before, the very small, small detail of which materials do we actually choose and, and how do we connect them um, all the way to the, to the bigger question of how are materials produced, how are they shipped, where do they come from? Um, and and uh, how can we how, how can we do that differently? How can we store data? How can we manage this kind of information, um, et cetera, et cetera? As I said before, the the talk is titled "From Resource Crisis to Material Abundance: um, The Potential of Circular Construction." And I wanted to start really with a with a big picture. Um, these are indicators um, by produced by by Stefan et al. Um, about kind of the history human's influence on, on the planet. Um, and uh, they have a very wide scope. I'm sure most of you have seen the slide. Um, it's it's uh, kind of the reason why we now talk about the, um, the Anthropocene or the Anthroposphere. Um, and, but what I find is so, so important about it is that there, most of these charts are, are very similar in, in, um, in the way they behave. Um, they all kind of start peaking uh, or start picking up in the 1950s um, and they all are to, to a certain extent exponential still. Um, and uh, as I said before, this is, this is the reason why we're now um, 
more or less officially since on the 19th of May in last year, um, the official working group that, that works on the kind of classification of the geological times that we're, that we're in um, officially suggested that we are now living in the Anthropocene. And um, the reason why this is so important is that um, until for the last 800,000 years, um, the geological time was determined by planetary movements. And so now human influence has suddenly become more important than the, the question how our planets circle around each other. And I think that's, that's something that we should all be aware of when we, when we um, go about in our daily lives. Um, two charts that um, have a very similar um, form to the ones that I already showed you are the question of how we deal with resources. Um, the left one shows the uh, global resource extraction um, for the last uh, century. Um, and I showed the right one as well, because um, you might say, well, we're just using more material because we're more people on the planet and we're more, um, uh, and, and um, some of us uh, use very much of it. But uh, if you then look at the per capita resource um, use, um, you have a very similar image. Um, and, and so it, it's not the fact that we are more people on the planet that uh, results in the fact that we use more material, but it is also simply the fact that we all every day use more uh, materials for, for our, our uh, livelihood. Um, and so the magenta here in the slide is the built environment, which has a significant um, portion of that, of that chart. Um, and if you, if you take everything together, um, building operation, building construction, um, uh, and um, basically the whole life cycle of, of buildings and infrastructure, uh, the built environment actually uses more than 50% of all the materials that are being extracted every year. Uh, we're producing more than 50% of all the solid waste that is being produced every year. Um, and we're emitting more or less 40% of all the carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions every year. So uh, the built environment actually has a huge impact on the way the, um, the planet is behaving at the moment. Um, and if we look at these uh, carbon emissions in a bit more detail, then of course, again, you have the same curve that I started with. Um, similarly, similarly picks up in 1950s and then goes more or less exponentially. Um, it, it's flattening a little bit now, fortunately, but, but it is a, a very, very steep growth. Um, and what we also know is that we need to more or less um, mirror that curve to get down to a uh, um, net zero or carbon uh, zero emissions um, if we want to somehow stay within the 1.5 um, degrees Celsius climate goal Paris, from, the, from the Paris Agreement. Um, and to get there, we actually need to um, very, very quickly reduce in the next 10 years um, to have a chance to, to reach these goals. And what baffles me always is that when we look at the carbon emissions, we're very good at dealing with, with the operational carbon, or we are getting somewhere <laughs> in dealing with operational carbon. But the discussion has been very um, uh, limited on what to do with, with embodied carbon. Um, and is this, uh, as this uh, chart shows, um, out of kind of the, this, um, this pie chart of all the building related carbon emissions, um, em the embodied carbon, so the production of materials and the construction actually has 11% um, of, that, of that chart. And that is, that is a significant amount. And if you take into consideration all the manufacturing and the industry part, the transport, uh, you actually have to add much more to that. So we're, um, we're, we're talking more like 20% um, influence of, of building materials. Um, and there's an, another aspect that is really important. And of course, that is the, the comparison, how um, embodied carbon behaves over time. Um, and so um, if, we, uh, if we look at this chart, then the embodied carbon, of course, is the same every year because it's input the first year and then, it, then it's there. 
it's, it's a, a kind of storage as well, if you want to put it that way. And the uh, operational carbon is added every year. And so if we want to reach a net zero in, for example, in Ithaca in, until 2030, then of that percentage within the next 10 years, the embodied carbon actually has 74% of that chart. Um, and so it's, it's even more important. And if you add to that, that we're getting better and better in the way we, we technically equip or, or design our buildings um, and the operational carbon is supposed to go down. Also in that aspect, the embodied carbon is becoming more and more important in that. In that can, you, can, you just give, can you just give quick examples of embodied versus operational carbon? Is, uh, is, operational is, is carbon. Sorry, um, I'm, I'm of course in my bubble here. Um, uh, the operational carbon is all the carbon that is um, produced through the operation of the building. It means heating, um, operation, the production of the energy that we need to run the computers in the building, all of that. Um, whereas the embodied carbon is all that carbon that's being emitted by the production of the materials and is then basically embodied in that brick, for example. So if I were to build a brick wall, then each of these bricks has a certain carbon value attached to it that was necessary to get the loam out of the earth, to burn it, to bring it there, to transport it to the site, and then to place it. And so this is the comparison of, of um, embodied and operational carbon. Um, and then lastly, um, of course, if we think about materials differently, and we don't produce them all the time fresh and out of virgin materials, um, then a reclaimed material or a cycled material um, has almost no um, added new carbon to it because you rescue and save that embodied values that are in that material. And the only added new carbon that you need to basically um, uh, add to that is, for example, transport and deconstruction which is a very small part of that um, compared to, for example, the production of new aluminum. Um, and so what one of the um, highly discussed solutions to that problem is really a paradigm shift in the way we deal with the economy, um, a shift from a linear economy to a circular economy um, where, we, where we don't waste resources and where we run this whole system on regenerative energy sources because, of course, every cycle needs a certain amount of new energy input. As I just said, you need to deconstruct something or you need to transport something. Um, and so it's also important that we make sure that all of these new inputs are coming from regenerative sources. But when we talk about a circular economy, what does that actually mean? And one of the um, interesting or probably for me most convincing definitions, and there is so far no no kind of internationally accepted definition for the circular economy. Um, but the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is probably one of the leaders in trying to, to shape that, that discussion and debate. And their definition is that a circular economy is one that is restorative and regenerative by design and aims to keep products, components, and materials at their highest utility and value at all times, distinguishing the sorry, distinguishing between technical and biological cycles. And for me, the most important part in that um, definition is by design, because the circular economy doesn't try to solve a problem at the end of the pipe. It doesn't try to make the filter better so that we have a little bit less uh, exhaust or emissions, but it tries to redesign the whole system so that we don't even need that filter in, if we want to stay in that metaphor. Um, and, and so for us architects and engineers, that is also a call to action because this is what we do and we, we design. So it's, it's both a kind of responsibility and, and, a, and a call for action. Um, and so that's a little bit what I'm trying to do with this lab here at, at Cornell. This is a screenshot from, from the website. Um, and of course, this idea isn't new. Um, it started with a, um, and, and Al really talked about this in his quick introduction, that the, the movement of the spaceship Earth, the, the new way of looking at the, at the planet, starting with this first image that we have um, by William Anders, um, where we suddenly realized, hey, this planet isn't, isn't uh, infinite. It's a finite little planet, and all the resources that we have are the ones that are there already. And so we have to somehow take care of that, of that planet. 
Um, but that was now 50, 60 years ago. And somehow, not if, at least in the building industry, not much has changed, unfortunately. Um, this is still kind of the status quo of how we deal with the built environment at the end of its, at the end of its life. Right? We're demolishing. Uh, if you want a more local reference, this is just a picture from uh, two months ago. Um, famous building in College Town. College Town Bagel was in there. Um, and it's a, it's a horrifying image if you want to look at it from a, from a materials perspective, because if you deal with these resources that way, none of this can be reused or recycled. This is all going directly to the landfill um, because you will never be able to separate this. Uh, you can also see in the, in the top uh, uh, right corner, the fridge is still in there. Uh, so they didn't even take care of kind of the, the most basic um, things to separate um, materials, uh, um, but, but just took the sledgehammer basically and demolish that. And this, unfortunately, is really the, the kind of the, the status quo. Um, and if you wanted to, to change that, um, it, is, it is quite a difficult endeavor because um, just a couple of examples for, for flat glass recycling, for example, and these are images from, from Germany, um, to actually make new flat glass out of recycled flat glass, it needs to be extremely pure. Um, uh, uh, the contamination of like a sand, the size of a sand corn in a ton of material is already too much um, to make new flat glass out of it. And, and so there are technical barriers that we need to talk about. Um, there are also um, uh, kind of questions of contamination um, with some of the, the timber here locally, for example, we're still talking about lead. Um, we're talking about the way it is deconstructed. Of course, if you're, if you're making this timber too small in its pieces, um, there's no way to, um, to, to recycle it because with timber, we can't melt it and pour a new tree. Um, so it, it's about the, the way we, we actually get materials out of this uh, resource um, or with, uh, with um, cement, concrete, minerals, um, uh, the problem is how to get them back together. Um, and so, for example, in concrete, uh, you can make recycling aggregates out of old concrete pieces, but you cannot make a new concrete block because you always need the new cement to then stick these aggregates together. So there's also kind of a, a design question. How, to, how do, you, do you deal with recycling in, in, um, in construction? Um, and then lastly, uh, one of the one of the more horrifying aspects of recycling in concrete is that, for example, now uh, we increasingly see asbestos again in new constructions because that um, recycling aggregate hasn't been cleaned well enough or hasn't been checked well enough before it turned into recycling concrete, um, and so one of the kind of preconditions of a circular construction is, of course, also that we talk much more about healthy materials. Um, we need to get rid of all the toxins because the worst thing that we can do is cycle toxins for the next 100 years or more. Um, and so we need to be also much more aware of the question, what kind of materials do we use and how do we use them? Um, this is a small example from Cortland. Just a month ago, I um, participated in the deconstruction of a a little mid-century um, residential unit. Um, and so there are cases where things happen um, and, and we pulled out wonderful timber out of this building, uh, 17 foot long sequoia uh, beams, uh, prime wood that, that, I mean, right now with all the wildfires going on, it's, it's even worth more. Um, this, this wood is as straight as it could be. It, it's uh, dry. It's, it's really um, better quality than whatever you could find right now if you go to Lois or, or Home Depot. Um, but of course, you can also see in this image that there are limits to what, what you can do at the moment um, with, for example, all the chips and boards, um, all the mineral waste that is still being produced in a deconstruction because it has never been designed for deconstruction. These buildings aren't meant to be taken apart because 
Um, and it's still like that uh, in the, the, most of the architects have the mentality that we're building forever, right? We're, we are putting this wonderful, unique building out there. Um, and, and it's, it's unlikely that this will ever be demolished somehow is, is, is the thought. But then if you look at what's actually happening um, in China, in Singapore, we have a, a building lifetime of in average 35 years. And, and so we are definitely not building for eternity anymore. And so the design of how to get, how to take that building apart again has to be um, probably at the forefront of, of um, the way we constructed in the first place. And this is something that already works quite well in, in uh, other sectors. Um, this is, for example, the first chair that was designed for the circular economy. It's a mirror chair, a very famous design piece, um, because all of the elements are, are pure to their material fractions. And so some of them can be composted, some of them can be recycled, but they can be recycled at a very high value because they don't mix certain, um, uh, um, certain materials or certain uh, um, combinations of metals, for example. Um, and all of them, and that's the advantage, of course, can be easily repaired because if you design for disassembly, you can also easily change a screw when it's broken or change a seating panel when it's broken. Um, and you don't have to throw the whole chair um, out and, and put it in landfill. So um, there, there are much more benefits to a design for disassembly strategy than simply the fact that at the end of life, you can take this building apart again. Um, automotive industry has implemented some of it, at least in Europe, we have a, a mandatory recycling rate for, um, for buildings, uh, for, for cars at, um, at 90% uh, of the weight, um, which has to be recycled at the end of the, the life of the car. Um, but we did an exercise with students at the ETH, um, and that's what this picture shows, uh, where the students actually took up took apart the whole car and, and tried to get to as many kind of um, clean fractions, material fractions as we possibly could. And that was still a very, very difficult exercise. And um, we noticed by taking, it's, it's, a, it's a very good pedagogic move to try to take something apart that hasn't been meant to be taken apart. Um, because you, at least that's my hope, these students will never do that mistake um, in, in their own drawings. Um, and, and maybe plan for that um, demolition or deconstruction uh, in a way that because they, they've had to deal with it in, the, in their own um, on their own. So basically, the idea is that, um, and this is of course a metaphor, uh, images uh, buildings in the future um, act as a material depot, right? So we we can assemble materials in a certain way, but these materials can be also reassembled in different ways, and and it's a constant kind of. Um, reassembly, you, you change the form, you change the, the way they are uh, connected, but you're not necessarily changing uh, the material and you're definitely not wasting the material. And this has a lot to do with the question, how do we and where do we um, implement these materials? Um, and it has to do with the kind of understanding that different parts of a building have a different lifetime. Uh, the structure has to be dealt much differently than the furnishing, for example, which is something that also isn't standard in, in architecture yet. We kind of, uh, at, at the handover to the client, we, we place a building there and say, this is it, right? This is as good as it gets. Um, but then certain parts change after five years and certain parts change after 10 years. Um, and if, if we were to design for those different life cycles, um, we'd already do a, a, a big, a big, very big step. Um, one example, uh, about 30 to 40% of the demolition waste comes from office refurbishing. So it's simply that eight, more or less every eight years an, an office is being completely overhauled. And it's all just interior, it's all just timber and gypsum boards and furniture but it plays an incredible amount of like by weight, percentage by weight in, in the overall problem. Um, and of course it had to do with, with the way we connect buildings. We need to make sure that um, 
connections are reversible and, and there are a lot of different techniques on, on how to do that. And I want to use the next couple of slides to show four projects that we've done in the last years um, where we addressed sim like single aspects of that. Um, uh, and, and just to give some ideas of how that could look like. The first project that I want to show is a uh, exhibition piece for the Biennale in Korea, in South Korea. Um, we did that 2017, it's called uh, the Microtree. Um, and what we did here is we used a waste product, the root network of a mushroom, mycelium mushroom, as a building material. Um, and so we're, first of all, using something that has never been meant and, uh, to, to be used again. It's a waste product. Um, but it is an incredibly interesting material uh, because this root network of this mushroom really grows into a matrix and it kind of grows around a substrate. And by that is basically a biological clue that can replace, if you, if you want to do the analogy, like a particle board, you'd have lots of little timber particles um, that are held together by, by formaldehyde. And if you wanted to replace that formaldehyde, you could use something like a self-growing glue, like, um, like mushroom. Of course, that grows under controlled environments. Uh, we did a lot of testing um, and uh, kind of then developed little, little um, uh, bricks, let's call them bricks, that in the end were assembled into this uh, structure. And it, this is the first um, load-bearing structure in the world out of mycelium. Um, there have been self-bearing structures before that, but this one actually carries the roof. And um, uh, it, it is a, something that we developed together with Philip Block, um, the Block Research Group at ETH, um, because the, the material in itself is quite weak still. Um, but if you use it accurately, if you do the correct engineering in it so that there is no bending and no tension forces in this tree, but only compression, then you have a very stable structure. And so this form comes from this engineering optimization that, uh, that we have a structure that only is loaded in compression. Um, we've developed this material further since then and really now have something that is very close to a particle board um, that we can use in construction and it's completely 100% compostable and, and bio held together just by, by mycelium. Um, by, by the mushroom root network. Um, another project that I wanted to show is uh, a little pavilion that we did in New York City in 2015, um, where we used really a, a waste product of a local waste product that um, is built completely out of uh, drinking cartons. Um, so that, that uh, composite material of paper carton uh, aluminum and um, uh, polyethylene um, kind of as, as, the, as the binder. And of course the, the printing uh, colors that, that are on the outside. Um, and what we did is we, we worked together with a local company um, that developed a, a material by, by scrambling this into or, or shreddering it into small pieces. And then by just applying heat and pressure um, making new panels out of this material. And uh, the benefit is that this is a process that, of course, once it's a downcycling, but then it can be redone um, several times. Um, and it is a, a substitute, as it's really meant as a building material, as a substitute for, for gypsum um, and, and interior cladding. Um, and the, we used it as a kind of a structural application for the first time. And again, did that with, with Philip Lock together to find a form that, that is only loaded in compression so that we could do that. Um, and so this is a, a kind of a vault structure made out of uh, 38 arches um, that are all pre-stressed um, and only held together, as you can see in this image, by, by packaging, by strap, by these straps. Um, and if you cut these straps, you have flat material again um, that you can then ship back to the manufacturer easily and, and very small in very small amount. Um, this is a picture of the whole pavilion at the end of the exhibition, um, uh, packaged again, and, and we shipped it back and they made new panels out of it. Uh, maybe one last thought about this. 
Um, of course, the aesthetics are a very important aspect of, of the kind of recycling or reusing of materials. And so what you can see here is uh, the different colors of, of, the, of the history of the product. The blue ones were milk cartons, the um, red orange ones were juice cartons. And then if you were to look in the other way, other direction, they are black from, from wine uh, cartons. Um, the most recent project uh, is a pavilion we built in 2019 for the federal um, garden show in garden exhibition in Germany. Um, and what we did here is really not talk about recycling that much, but talk about reuse and reuse of something that is um, in a structural application. And we wanted to figure out how do you get that through the code? How do you, how do you actually get approval to reuse a structural material? Um, when you, and, and this is the, the biggest problem, I think, or one of the biggest problems in actually um, uh, getting a circular economy off the ground, when you have no information about the history of that material, you have no documentation, we had no idea, um, in this case, we, we uh, reused steel, we had no idea what steel that is, what history it had, had it been in an earthquake, had it been in a fire, um, what, what are the structural capabilities of that material? So this is a project that evolved out of a student competition. Um, these are the, the two students that presented kind of the first version of this, of this idea. Um, and it then uh, we then took it into my, my um, office. I also have a, uh, an architect's office in, in Germany. Um, and we did the, the kind of architectural optimization and the engineering um, ourselves. Um, and basically, it, it's a project that has four layers, four material layers. The, the complete um, skin is made out of recycled glass. Then we have the structure that is out of reused steel. Um, all the furnishing is out of um, recycled household plastics. And then we have the ground, which is all reused and recycled mineral waste. I'm going to go from the bottom up. So we have this kind of reused mineral waste, which are partially just, you know, um, plasters uh, like stones from, from other um, exhibitions that we, that we put on the ground um, or um, um, actual a, a very nice product that I'm going to show in the next project a little bit more. Um, uh, new stones that are made out of um, demolition waste um, and uh, the biggest amount, this kind of white snowy part that you can see in the right image are um, recycled uh, ceramics. Um, and so we, we crushed these uh, ceramics that were a waste product and were to go to the landfill anyways. Um, and we, we reused them in this water bound surface. And that gave an amazing um, effect because it really sparkled and, and, and it was shining as, as if they, it had just snowed in that, in that area. Um, then these are 3D printed chairs that were used um, that are done completely out of uh, household plastic waste that was collected and, and cleaned and sorted and then extruded again. Uh, we have this um, skin of the pavilion that is made out of um, industrial glass waste. Um, and I'm also going to go a bit more in detail in the next project on that material. but. The beauty of it is that it, it, it uses just enough energy to make a kind of solid material out of it again, um, but not, um, not too much to actually get a, a kind of homogeneous um, look. So you can still see the shards of this, uh, of this material and it, it gives this incredible aesthetic that is only possible because it is a recycled material. And so that added value um, in terms of, of aesthetics and design um, I believe is, is crucial in, in uh, kind of upgrading the material value of, of materials like that. Um, this is how it looks like. So the, the green is actual um, it's our wine, wine bottles. Um, Germany has a very good recycling system for those. So you get a, almost a, um, a kind of, um, yeah, a, a very well sorted um, resource that you can use. Um, and this kind of transparent image that I showed earlier is from uh, car, car window um, screens. Um, and then, as I said before, we had this um, steel structure, which comes from a former coal-fired power plant in, in Germany. 
um, we're shutting down all our um, coal-fired power plants at the moment to to increase the uh, kind of um, renewable um, sources. Um, and so this was uh, blown up um, a, a year ago. Um, there's nothing left there. It's, it's just um, one big explosion happened. But a couple of weeks before that, we were able to pull um, steel out of it as, as almost as if we were to go into a forest. We, we took a spray can basically and marked the ones that we thought could be could be reusable um, and took them out um, and then went through a lot of testing. Um, and that's the reason why reuse is much more important at the moment than, than uh, the new virgin material, which is absurd because we got the material for free. Right, so, um, but then because of all the, the, the necessary tests to prove, and in the end, we proved that this material is a standard steel um, STJ35, according to the, uh, the German norm, uh, you, could, you could easily just reuse that. Um, but it, we needed five tests to do that. We needed a, a notch test, we needed an impact test, we needed a, um, a, the chemical composition of it. Um, we needed uh, um, a bending and, and, and tensile tests. Um, and, and so all of these, uh, and of course not on one sample, but of course on, on a very big variety of samples. Um, and so creating that kind of history of the material again is the bottleneck in, in reusing it. Because in the end, of course, that history um, adds to the value, if, if you wanted to play it right, adds to the value of, um, of the of the pavilion. Um, and so this are an interior shot of, of this pavilion um, that's looking up from the inside. Um, and you see how this how this uh, tree structure develops in there. And of course the idea of that tree structure is that we can reuse as much of the um, dimensions of the of the steel that we were able to to salvage. Um, and so we didn't have always the same amount of long beams, but we had a, a very big variety of dimensions and of, of sizes to, to play with. Um, and so that's, that's then how this, how this tree developed to really follow the, the structural engineering, uh, follow the local um, forces that we have in each of these, um, each of these beams and, and assign the specific dimensions to it. And this is how it's, it looks at night. Um, standing on this on this recycled ceramics. Um, the last project is a um, a full building. Um, not not all of it. What you're seeing here is is by us, but basically that's the second story, the one that is in this copper frame. Um, it's a project that we did together with uh, the office of Werner Zobeck uh, in 2018, um, and it really tries to go as far as we can in today's um, uh, industry and really prove that we can design something that is that can be 100% recycled and reused. And so we, we really questioned every detail and thought about how can we do this differently? How can we do this in a reversible, with a reversible connection? Um, and, and at the same time, keep this kind of aesthetic um, expectations that you have on a uh, on a building nowadays, and not make it look like it's it's bio or it's recycled. Of course, there's there's this aspect in it, but it, it had to be a really high um, high performance space, of course, and also a high uh, high quality um, space. Um, and so we have basically three, three loops in there and here comes uh, into play this uh, separation of the biological and the technical cycle, which is essential because the biological on the right is, is a much bigger cycle. We can make, um, as you can see, for example, a, a, a former tree can turn into uh, the nutrient for a mushroom, which then turns into an insulation material, which then can be composted and turns into uh, a, a corn. Um, to feed to feed us, um, so that's that's there's that's a much bigger loop that we're talking about. Whereas on the left side, the technical cycle is a very direct cycle. Ideally, if you have, for example, a PET bottle, um, if you reuse that in in the cleanest way possible, you get a really nice PET bottle out of it again. But you don't go back to 
um, to, to uh, the fossil um, petroleum based um, resource and, and make a different plastic out of it. So um, the technical recycling cycle is a much, much smaller, much more direct um, cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, and the other aspect that we implemented here is really a modular construction. So on the right side, you basically see how every of these elements are, are um, assembled. And of course, in the reverse log uh, logic, also how you can disassemble this whole thing again. Um, it was prefabricated in, in seven modules. Um, and we had a construction site of one day, um, two cranes bringing these modules um, to the location and then basically placing them in the right location. Um, they are, uh, they're sitting on, on, I mean, these are basically the foundations, but it's a rail system. Um, they're, they are based on, on wheels. Um, you roll them in the right location, you pin them down with two screws in the, in the floor, um, and that's it. Um, and so the building owner, of course, also very much appreciated this kind of um, um, short construction time. Um, on site. Um, I promise that I'm going to show a, a product here quickly. This is uh, this, these bricks that we used for this wall in the, that you saw in the second image in, in, in the main living room. Um, and what we tried to do there is to question, can we build a brick wall out of mineral waste um, and without any glues or, or um, kind of permanent fixtures without mortar or plaster. Um, and so we developed a new type of stone, um, which isn't really a, a new invention, but um, which has a kind of groove and tongue system and, and three holes for, uh, for metal bars. And so you can stack that um, uh, system up and then at the top and the bottom fix um, fix the screws so that you can post tension the system and so you have in the end a, a, a structural brick wall without any um, adhesives in it of any kind and so you could also loosen the screw and, and kind of change it to a different wall system different shape um, or change this specific system and, and do and put in different different bricks um, and so you have this flexibility to to adapt um, to adapt in the space. Um, the other big question that we had to deal with is how do you get a bathroom uh, watertight um, without any sealants, without any silicone, without any glues. Um, so we couldn't use, for example, small tiles because we couldn't glue them um, into a water, waterproof surface um, with, with the help of mortars or plasters. Um, and so we're, we're using very big tiles here, um, almost like um, floor to ceiling high of two different systems. Um, and on the left side, again, you see this glass that I talked about already. Um, and on the right side, you see a, a kind of similar approach with recycled HDPE plastic, so high density polyethylene. Um, this is uh, a close up of that glass that I talked about where you can really see these, these shards, um, beautiful, beautiful material. Um, and similarly, this is a, this is this HDPE plastic that is made out of uh, former kitchen cutting boards, um, but now has this, uh, so you can also here see the, the pieces, um, but uh, it gives a really interesting, um, aesthetics. And, and um, then there are two more concepts that I wanted to address. Um, one is uh, we didn't find any, and, and that was the case for many products, but this is the example, uh, any faucets on the market uh, that were recyclable. Um, because the standard is you have three or four materials that are pressed together. Um, the, the process is optimized for to, to get that out as quickly as possible, but there's no no thought about how do you separate these material resources ever again. And so what we did is we print, 3D printed our own um, faucets out of, um, um, out of steel in this case. Um, and uh, so this is the, the whole thing with the mechanics, um, the interior, everything, movable parts is just in one printing process. And so it's also one material. Um, and if you wanted, you could, uh, you could melt it down and make a new faucet out of it um, because you have a, a, a kind of 100% um, clean source to do that without any contaminations. 
um, or we um, kind of reinvented um, the, the heating systems because also there the standard right now is glue. You have five different materials that are fixed together um, by glue. And, and we just asked the company, hey, can we not do this kind of the old style? Can we not use a screw? And they were, uh, they really had problems with that. Um, and we built a lot of prototypes to get enough um, uh, conduction. Um, so to get the materials fixed together uh, close enough so that actually the heat can travel from one material to the next. Um, but of course the screw works. We've done that for many, many years. Um, and so now this, uh, the system um, can be very cleanly and very easily separated again into its, its material resources. We used the um, mycelium uh, in this insulation material on the walls. Um, and we um, did something that I think has huge potential and I would like to do much more research here at Cornell on that is, uh, is question, what is the business map model behind, oops, sorry, the business model behind the materials that we're using? Um, and so, for example, the carpets that we have in this uh, unit uh, are only leased because the company developed a new carpet that is 100% recyclable and then realized Hey, why would I give that to the end consumer um, without any control of that wonderful resource that I have there? Um, and so they changed their business model and are now only renting the, the material. Eight years later, it comes back as a resource to make new carpets out of it. Um, and you have the guarantee that it comes back and you can also plan with it as a resource. You know, hey, in eight years, I have this and this much material to work with. Um, and so you have much more control over the, um, the considerably volatile resource market with business models like that. And then much of it, of course, is documentation. I've mentioned that before, the importance of documentation. Um, so we built up a, a material library here of, of different um, recyclable materials. I have that also here and want to build it up at Cornell. Um, I have those samples all in my office. I mean, much more than that. Um, we have the kind of information that is necessary behind that, um, all the kind of specific values that are necessary. Um, we, of course, build a physical library into this unit because it's a very public unit so that people can see what is behind the wall or inside the wall. Um, and we started setting up material passports and that's the last little um, uh, topic that I want to mention today <coughs> um, because um, it, all of these issues that I mentioned about having to test the material um, derived from the fact that we don't have enough information um, about this specific material. And, and so setting up material passports would basically document which material is where in a building, what type of material is it, what kind of specifics that it have, how is it connected to the next material um, and, and how can it be taken out again um, uh, is, is something that is essential to get the circular economy running in the built environment. And so these are excerpts from a, uh, one of the leading companies that provide material passports. This is uh, the Madastra, um, short for a material cadastre. Um, and this is basically the summary of this, of this unit that I just showed. Um, how much material is where, for example, how much material is in the skin, what type of materials are in the skin. Um, but the, what they also do is calculate a circularity indicator, um, a so-called CI score, uh, where our building right now has the highest value in that database, um, which is nice. But um, for me, it's much more important to have like a, to use it as a, as a tool, this kind of value. Um, and so here at the, circular econo uh, at the Circular Construction Lab, I started programming a application for Rhinoceros, which is the design software that um, most of our students here use um, to actually on the fly calculate these values while, while the student is designing in an early design phase. And I think that's, that's very important because you get the immediate feedback by designing or deciding what kind of material do you use for which location what, can, what the impact um, in terms of circularity um, this decision has and, and, and what other decisions you could, or what other questions, and I think that's an important part pedagogically, what other questions should I be asking at that moment? Um, uh, and and I, I would 
by doing by, by using a tool like that, you would ask certain questions much earlier in the process than you would usually do in a kind of standard architectural um, uh, process. So this is just a little screen grab from from that tool where you can see, for example, you can also highlight which objects in in uh, in the building have which material, what kind of um, um, values are attributed to that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, of course, upscale that. This is something that we did for Singapore a couple of years back to figure out which materials are in the built material, in the, in the stock, in the uh, built environment at, at which moment, and how does that change over time, estimating um, a certain growth and predictions uh, that, the, that the government made at that time. Um, and so trying to figure out which material resources will be available, for example, in five years when you start a kind of design project? Um, because one of the limiting factors is also this gap between um, the, the demolition or the deconstruction and the design of a new building, right? Because the design and with permit process, et cetera, it takes a couple of years, but you never know a couple of years in advance what material resource you get out of a demolition or deconstruction project. Um, and so closing that gap is going to be another big question um, that we have to deal with. And I'm trying to do that here for, for Ithaca locally um, by creating a, a material and circularity cadastre, um, which would, for example, allow us to see what is the material value or the material content of specific buildings in advance. Of course, ballpark figure. But at least you would know, okay, this and this amount of material resources are in there. Um, and so it could be a very interesting tool for, for permit processes, for, um, uh, for contractors, um, and for the planning of, um, of salvage projects. Um, and of course, it would allow us to, in much more specificity, understand the local material stops and flows of the built environment. Um, yeah, and I think with that, um, looking forward to your questions. Felix, can I ask a question? Please. Are you having any impact on what they're doing in College Town? Um, not yet. Um, but I'm I'm trying. Uh, we are in in contact with. Um, with the uh, contractor um, that recently bought uh, these, uh, I think, seven lots um, that are boarded up at the moment. Um, and there, there are talks about actually salvaging some of those materials, um, definitely documenting these buildings. Um, so um, I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to get in there. We also, uh, and, and Al can talk to that as well, we're also in the process of forming a task force um, to um, to work towards a, a deconstruction ordinance for for Ithaca. Um, this is a process that's going to take a couple of years, um, and we're going to run into a lot of obstacles. Um, but I think it's it's very well yes. trying, um, and it's it's a very interesting task for us because we have uh, we have really a high level um, high level and very diverse set of of people on that on that group, and and so I'm I'm. I'm hopeful, um, but we're just in the in the beginning of yeah. that. Yeah, well, good luck. I've, I've, I've tried to get Cornell to think about putting bricks where they have asphalt for parking. Seems to be very difficult. All they, all they need to do is go to Europe and see what it's like and then come yeah. back and do it. Yeah. I mean, that's, of course, the mentality that I bring with me. I've, I've, until yeah. generally, I've, I've done these projects in, in Europe. And, and so I, I hope that maybe some of this experience of, of actually knowing it, it works, it does work, and this, these are the possible paths that you can, can use yeah. in there, um, could, could help in this process. Um, can I ask a question, sort of follow-up or related? Please. If, you, if you look at that building in College Town, and just the photograph you have there, there's certainly most of the world would, would have people scrambling over that, taking those pieces of wood. Like, it was pretty even though it wasn't designed for deconstruction, uh, it seems like it would almost pay, um, you know, $15 an hour for somebody to go into that pile and just grab the pieces and bang the nails in or bang the nails out. Do you know what the, um, 
like right now, what the economics would be of, of um, you know, taking that whole building and spreading it out in the line and, and just having people pick at it. Um, is that, I mean, it seems, I mean, wood is maybe so cheap here, but it's not, it's not that cheap. And it, it's just all this good wood just sitting there. Yeah. Um, actually, the economics of that aren't connected to the material value, unfortunately. They're connected to time. And the time that the demolition takes um, before you then can restart the new construction um, seems to be more valuable if you get it done in three days versus um, the two or three weeks that you need to carefully deconstruct it. What if you don't, what if you don't carefully deconstruct it? You just take that stuff just the way they have it dump it into trucks, take it away, and then, and then you know, put it in a, in a, in a manageable shaped pile uh, and then pick at it. It seems like there was lots of, lots of wood there that was just like, you could almost pick it up. Yeah, I mean, I've, um, there, there, there are questions of liability, um, who's allowed on that site. Um, the, the questions are much, much bigger, unfortunately, than, than the material value. But I've, um, I'm in, in very close contact with Diane Cohen. I don't know if um, some of you might know her. She's the reuse center. Um, the, the managing director of the Finger Lakes Reuse. Um, and they, of course, have a business model based on, on that. Um, they do deconstructions from time to time um, with a lot of difficulties, most of it with um, uh, volunteer work um, to make it somehow feasible uh, in terms of cost. Um, uh, and um, right now, this is unfortunately still a niche um, a niche operation. Um, while I completely agree with you that 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 is a complete loss of of the material values, and it's something that that we have to address and change, um, and will hopefully change. I have a question. Um, are there any concerns, or have you experienced any issues with degassing of materials when being reused? Um, you know, for instance, if it was a uh, material that was mostly in a colder climate and now it's in a warmer climate and now some of the gases from the material are now coming out, have there been any issues or concerns around that? Um, yeah, in, in generally, the um, circular economy is a very local economy um, because um, the biggest cost in that in that whole operation is then the transport, which is weird because in in uh, kind of new construction transport doesn't play any role in the in the costing, right? We happily take materials from from China that we ship all around the world um, because transport in, essentially is dirt cheap um, at the moment, way too cheap when you look at it in, in terms of sustainability aspects. Um, uh, but then for the for the local economy, it it is. It, it is a very, very local operation, um, which is good because you have local jobs hang, uh, attached to it. You have uh, the kind of local uh, cultural values that you're protecting, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the fact, the question, if a material completely changes climate zones happens very rarely. Um, doesn't mean that we don't have to be very careful with what we do with these materials. We need to of course know which materials we reuse and which ones we don't. Um, there, there are a lot of contaminants um, and, uh, and in terms of gases or in terms of mostly actually paints and, and sealants are the problem um, that, that we need to address most. Um, and so that needs to be needs to be taken care of. And, and that again leads to the question of documentation. If we, if we know in advance what is in a building, um, be it through an audit or be it through actually a kind of long running material passport, um, then these questions become much, much easier to handle. Thank you. In, in the example you showed from Cortland, um, how was, you know, what was the origin of that and the economic feasibility? Or was that just a demonstration or is that going to be reused all those materials? Yeah, the, the materials are being reused. Uh, this, uh, the origin of that project is uh, kind of the, the formation of a new reuse center in Cortland. So Cortland reuse um, starts up next year. Um, uh, and um, they basically had the chance to uh, deconstruct a building that belongs to the city of Cortland. Um, it's in the flight path of the airport, so it had to go. 
um, and they were allowed to kind of do this as a as a demonstrator project in collaboration with uh, with Finger Lakes Reuse, and it uh, it was done completely based on volunteer work, uh, which um, yeah made this made it a very long process also. <laughs> Um, but uh, all of the materials that were salvaged are, are reused. Um, a, a fantastic wood that was basically sold off the off the deconstruction site. Um, um, but all of this, I mean, this is an economy that basically runs on on Greg's list at the moment. And and so you, you'd uh, put put on Greg's list, hey, I have this and this amount of of timber, and and then someone might or might not see that uh, and and go for it because he needs it at that specific moment. Um, and so again, there's this time question. If, if you were to be able to say in four months, I have this and this amount of timber available, uh, and an architectural office could plan that in or a contractor could plan that in. Um, uh, because of course, the, the biggest problem is storage. In, I mean, that's the other big cost factor. And so no, no reuse center wants to have big amount of materials on, in, in storage. Um, for the case that someone in the future might possibly need it. Um, and so most of it is always the, the, the best, or the goal is always to sell it off the lot uh, where you take it down. Um, Felix, I wanted to ask you a question about the concrete structures. As concrete um, seems to be a dominant construction materials in some parts of the world, um, Miami where I live included, right? <laughs> because of the corrosive environment and many other issues. Um, where do you see concrete structures in a circular economy? Because the way I see it, the way to use the concrete structure or reuse them is just to break it, grind it, and use that um, aggregate somewhere else if you want. Which if you want to use it again in construction, it adds some steps because that concrete might be contaminated with chlorides, with um, you know asbestos and different uh, contaminants. Um, what do you think about concrete structures? And also a follow-up question is that in an industry that is shifting towards reducing embodied carbon, do you see concrete structures losing their popularity? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question and a very complex one. Um, concrete counts for 8% of carbon emissions globally. So if you take that whole chart, transportation, for all of transportation has 11, concrete has eight. Um, so this one material is is dominating this whole question, um, and so that is it's an incredibly important question to address. Um, uh, and and there are certain like, very different ways of of doing that. Of course, there is uh, recycling concrete, um, which uh, solves part of the issue uh, because um, on four percent of these eight, so half of this of the concrete um, pie comes from the production of um, of the cement and the aggregate. Um, and, and so there's something that, that of course you can take part of that away, although it's, it's a small part um, because the production of the cement is still the dominating problem. Um, but then on the other side, as you mentioned correctly, um, you always need new cement to, to, to hold together this aggregate. Um, and simply the chemical reaction of the curing process of concrete adds the other 4% of that, of that chart. So the, the curing um, emits uh, carbon into the air. Um, and so as long as we're using the material, we, we can make this process of production as efficient as we can. And, and, and I think we're, we're, we're almost there. I think there's, there's very little cement producing companies can still do to make that process more efficient. Um, but the, the problem in it is kind of an inherent chemical problem of the material itself. Um, and so reducing the amount of concrete that we're using would be a very good step, in my opinion, um, uh, to, to kind of re reuse, uh, reduce carbon emissions. Um, and in many cases, uh, there's, there's a design solution to that because if you if you look at how how architects or architecture students uh, sometimes approach a design project is you you go you start with the form and you, you come up with some some conceptual shape which is all good but the question about okay out of which material do we actually build that usually comes way too late and so you have you have a certain shape in mind 
And at, at that point, when you then ask the question, okay, how do I actually build it? The only possibility that is left usually is reinforced concrete because it is a material that can do almost anything. Whereas if you start with the material in the first, second week, and you know what material you want to build this out, the form will be different, but it will also be buildable with a different material. Um, and so something that we're now implementing at Cornell, and I'm, I'm responsible for the core first year design studio, um, and I really start them off with, with materials. They, they have to, they, they, they get the material assigned in the first week, and then they, they come up with a form that, that is doable with that, with that material. Um, and so we're hoping that by changing the order around, um, some of this, of course, leads to a reduction of, of concrete use um, in the end. Um, there's also no necessity for a kind of international style that looks the same in every location. I mean, if you want to go back to some more sustainable architectural styles, then, then using local materials is a, is a very good solution. Um, and that is, um, that's something that usually speaks also against the use of, of concrete. Um, or at least to, to, the, to a reduction of the amount of concrete per building. Because, I mean, maybe there's a, a sense in using it as a, as a structural material, but maybe it doesn't need to be the full facade and, you know, everything cast in concrete. There. So there's also a kind of variant in, in that. And then the last part of that answer could be that, of course, instead of recycling concrete, you could reuse concrete. Um, if you were able to have prefab elements that are actually modular enough to be reused several times, because concrete in itself is a, is a, is a very good material. Um, if you manage the corrosion somehow, which, which is the 90% of all the damages in concrete come from corrosion. So if you, if you produce it correctly, you can use it for quite a, quite a time. Um, and uh, the Scandinavian countries are quite far in that, um, not, um, in, interestingly enough, not from a kind of sustainability point of view, um, but because uh, they want to construct year round. And it is in many times of the year, it's too cold to cast in situ concrete. And so they, they developed a different type of construction that is much more based on prefab elements, which you can do in heated uh, um, uh, indoor climate um, and then just bring to the construction site and so they have snap and fit connections of these con um, of these prefab elements versus what we're still doing in many parts of the, um, uh, the world uh, to connect then prefab elements with in situ concrete for the for the connection right uh, which which of course um, hinders then the reuse because you can't get these uh, prefab elements detached again. But if you actually have a system where you just snap and fit and bolt these prefab elements, you can equally and, and without damage bring them to a different place and, and reuse them. So that is something that I would also be very interested um, in seeing more in the future. Well, F Felix, I'd like to thank you very much for your really fascinating talk. And at least I found it extremely inspiring. I was thinking about even mechanical engineering students um, when you show the chair. <laughs> um, and uh, we run out of time now, and I want to thank you very much. And I don't know quite how we clap in this kind of environment. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure. <laughs>